I'm Matt Reynolds, and this is my podcast. I can do the job, but running the business is quite difficult. But a lot of tradesmen lack, and I was probably one of them, is business skills. I don't mind making mistakes. You learn from your mistakes. Information is all around you in the minds of people that work beside you. Welcome back. To the Trench Talk podcast. I'm Matt Reynolds, and this week I was in Sydney to interview Sachi Wickrimagay, a jury member of the United Nations World Summit Awards Global Contest, a panel that selects and promotes the world's best disruptive digital innovation technologies with a positive impact on society. He is also appointed as the national expert for Australia by the United Nations World Summit Awards to spearhead the World Summit Awards Australian chapter. In addition to all of that, Sachi is the Chief Operating Officer at i for Trades. The idea of these discussions, for those of you joining us for the first time, is to go into the trenches of achievement and talk, not with people who are orchestrating from some lofty perspective, but to those high performers who are actually in the trenches honing their craft. That has included guests from the worlds of business, sport and entertainment, all of whom are on the front lines doing amazing things. Prior to joining i for Trades in 2017, Suchi worked as Head of Senad Outsourcing, a wholly owned subsidiary of Senad Software International. In his 10 plus years with the group, he managed over 50 large, highly scalable IT projects spanning across multiple sectors varying from telco, HR, e-commerce, finance and healthcare to entertainment. Suchi has a strong passion for mobile apps and has managed over 70 mobile app projects. He also co-founded the mobile and wearable apps Flipbeats and Expense Tracker 2.0, which have won 13 international awards to date while generating enormous media buzz. These apps have an active user base of over 1 million worldwide. During our chat, we also covered his work and thoughts on sustainability, including his work involving the United Nations, how he designed a system that facilitates over 8.5 million transactions every day, the marketing campaign they used during the World Cup that sent his app Flipbeats to number one, that's downloads, in Brazil, how he got Flipbeats preloaded on all the Samsung Galaxy S5 smartphones that T-Mobile released in Germany, and the challenges of building large IT systems. To find out more about Sachi and his current work, just Google his name, spelt S-A-C-H-I-W-I-C-K-R-A-M-A-G-E. If you enjoy Trench Talk, head to trenchtalkpodcast.com and opt in for the newsletter. We'll make sure you're notified when every episode of the show is released. Enjoy my chat with Sachi Wickrimagay. Sachi, thanks for doing this. Thank you for having me, Matt. We're in my hotel room in your hometown of Sydney today. Okay. Now, you are involved with the UN. Let's start with your title. <laughs> they call me the uh, national expert for Australia. Okay. And the second title is jury member. Yes. The entity that I am directly attached to is yes. World Summit Awards, okay. which itself is an entity set up by United Nations to identify the world's best and most creative and innovative IT software products and solutions out of 180 plus UN countries. Okay, so you just recently returned last week from a trip to Vienna. Correct. And I've got it written here, the World Summit Awards Global Congress. You got it right. Tell me about the trip. Very interesting trip, Matt. Yes. Uh, It was the World Summit Awards uh, Global Congress for the year 2018, Mm -hmm. which was held in Vienna. And... It um, was spanning across multiple days. We had several sessions on different topics, workshops. This was in addition to the uh, grand jury which we held uh, to select the winners and the global champions for the year 2018. Okay. And once we selected the winners, we had another session, very interesting engaging session at the United Nations headquarters in Vienna to discuss with the UN executives and to sort of enlighten them about how these winners that we have selected are contributing positively to the sustainable development goals set by the UN itself. Okay, so we're talking about technology companies that Correct. were presenting at this summit? Not necessarily technology companies. These okay. are companies who bring solutions by using technology as an enabler, okay. so to say. Have you got a good example for us of one of the uh, companies? I can pick one. There was this very interesting project. It was from Montenegro. 
Yes. And it was called B and Me. B and Me. Yeah. Yes. It, it was kind of an eye opener. Okay. Because you might have heard of uh, a quote famously referred to as uh, said by Albert Einstein himself if there are no bees in the world, human beings will have about four years to live yes. mainly because of the colony collapse disorder. It's kind of a problem which is mostly concentrating on the US and the European countries. Yes. So BNME is an initiative they are looking at. It's kind of a baby monitor for bees. Okay. If you look at beehives, yes. there are sensors to identify the uh, health levels and the temperature and the atmosphere in the beehive. Is it positive? Is it uh, contributing to the growth of the bees or is it harmful to them? And if it is not positively contributing, immediately alerting the owners to make sure corrective measures can be taken then and there. So are you measuring the environment or the, the bees themselves, the baby bees? Uh, it's actually the environment where baby bees are growing in. Okay, got it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so that's a very uh, kind of a big eye-opener to all of us. It was like, wow. Yes. That, that, that's, that's, that's quite nice, quite interesting. So this company has developed software it's, with sensors? How does that come together? It's actually uh, done by two PhD students. Okay. Uh, it's a combination of software and hardware both. Right. There are hardware components and sensors yes. which they embed to the beehives. At the same time, that provides sensors, the details to the software, which reads continuously and analyzes and sends feeds by feedback to the uh, owners to make sure that it's like you know taking care of your baby. Your baby's sleeping in the other yeah. room, everything's fine, nothing to worry. I know all about uh, correct temperatures and, exactly. and uh, monitoring the space and making yes. sure it's safe and all those other things. Exactly. So we're doing that for, or that, sorry, that company is doing, is doing that for bees. Yeah. So there's different people that come together with different ideas and slash inventions. I guess you'd say. Correct. And then what, what's your actual role there? Because I know that you spoke at the summit and you presented a few of your own ideas and that sort of thing. Correct. So what's your role there? At two levels, Matt. Now, yes. as a jury member, I'm responsible to be part of the grand jury to in selecting the... Uh, because we get about more than 400 entries from 180 plus countries. Okay. It's, it's actually one of the most uh, difficult tasks to do in selecting who's the best one right out of okay each category we have only eight categories yes everyone is a winner yeah and then you know it's, it's a very sensitive decision we have to collectively take so i'm part of the jury and you know i'm contributing together with the others to make sure we all bring different viewpoints to the okay. table of course yeah. and our measurement sticks are slightly different to one to another yeah so that is one of the contributions plus as the national expert for australia my other responsibility is to bring um, identify good innovations which is happening in Australia itself and to bring it to the global stage. Okay. And that's a new role actually. So this AI did not have the opportunity to bring any initiative to the World Summit Awards Global Congress, but next day definitely. So you're going to be looking at ideas, companies, solutions Correct. that fit this innovation, I suppose in the sustainability space, Absolutely. have I got that yes. right? Absolutely. And then yes. taking them uh, like holding the, their hand through the process to take them to the awards or how, how does that... Um, First of all, we had to do the proper scanning and skimming processes to identify because there are so many entrepreneurs in the country and there are so many uh, different scales, so to say, you know, smaller startup to the largest corporation. Yes. It doesn't matter the size of the business or the number of employees and how, what is their bottom line. That's not what World Summit Awards or UN is responsible or interested about. It's about how these ventures are contributing positively to the society at yeah. a local level. Yes. And so we believe at local level contributors are identified like that. If they are promoted, if they are given the more uh, significant spotlight, yes. they will be more enabled, they will be uh, energized, they will be given the tap on the back to accelerate their journey. And is there people that look at what you're doing and, and what these awards are all about to fund these projects moving forward? Is that is that part of it or not? Funding exactly is not a part of it. Okay. But us bringing them to this stage definitely brings them to prominence. It and gives them the exposure that, that could lead them, them to... the radar of a lot of interesting people because there are a lot yes. of uh, investors and entrepreneurs and um, even philanthropists keep their radars on. Th that's moment, what I was alluding to, moment, yeah. Yeah, moment yeah. you bring them to this stage, it's like half of the journey is done. Yes. Yeah. What did you talk about? Because you had the stage on... You did seven presentations, did I have that right? They were close to seven, eight sessions, you know, this week okay. the mentoring session. We had uh, the youth entrepreneurs from uh, European 
uh, awards are coming there to get okay. inspiration from different experts and also we had mentoring sessions, one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions of sharing our ideas, right. our experiences, what we did, how we did, what mistakes we did, how yeah. they can avoid doing the same thing again and things like that too, um, group level discussion sessions to workshops too and the picture that you were looking at, that was at the UNHQ where we were having discussions with the UNHC senior executives and enlightening them about the winning projects okay. that we selected by yep. the grand jury and uh, we were emphasizing on um, the UN executives to get their attention on these projects and because UN is kind of a hub, it has so many entities attached to it, yes. so different different um, enablers are gathering around it, so the yep. moment we bring the right uh, viewpoint to that, right attention to it, it can go viral, that's what we did. How did you get involved at this level because I'm assuming that you have to have some sort of results on the board, if you like. You must have some sort of creditable background to be selected by these people to judge these awards and, and be responsible for bringing some of these projects you know, into the spotlight, as you put it. So how did you first get involved? Interesting story. I didn't have any idea of getting involved with any of these ventures. Yes. Uh, the, uh, the shortest version of the story is uh, during my previous venture where I was working in a software company. I was doing this, um, I co-founded two mobile apps on my own together with the company. Yeah. One of these applications, Mobile First Ventures, in 2005 became a winner in the World Summit Awards. And okay. that got me to uh, uh, attend the World Summit Awards Global Congress, which was held in Singapore in 2016. And that's the first time I met this amazing bunch of people, highly energetic. I was like extremely pumped. I was, I was in my best version. <laughs> so they selected your work to come to the summit. So when I attended this summit, you know, yep. I was, uh, that was like, uh, if I have to explain a little bit more about, yes. I haven't met such an energetic bunch of people in my life before. Okay. And everyone talks about the same values, same passion, and they're driven. They're from around the globe, representing different, different countries. Yep. So I was very uh, highly engaging with them. Once this was over, the World Summit Awards Organizing um, Committee, they reached out to me and they were asking, uh, based on the contribution that I did at that summit, they were asking, are you interested to be part of us? And we, will you be willing to contribute to the grand jury? I said, definitely, why not? I was like, wow. It, it was, that, was that an email you got? Was it a phone uh, call? That was an email followed okay. by a phone interview yes. and, and a confirmation. And how many times did you read the email before you thought it was oh. really true? I can't count. <laughs> <laughs> I, bet. I, I bet it was a few times. So you, you had the invite, you said yes, and then that, that started your journey with the UN, right? Exactly. That, that, that's how I started with the World Summit Awards. And once I migrated to Australia, then yep. I got the second surprise call. They wanted to appoint me as the national expert for Australia, which I, with both hands, um, wide open, welcomed. And in the same space, doing the same uh, judging, if you like, of these ideas, yeah? Correct, correct. Okay. Two responsibilities. I play the role of the uh, ju one of the jurors for the global platform, yeah. plus me, the national expert, which is a more local responsibility, Matt, yes. to look at the Australian domain yes. itself and to uh, be the guiding light in Australian uh, social entrepreneurship landscape to pick deserving people and to bring them to the attention of the uh, Global platform. So you see quite a variety of stuff and really good stuff from around the world, right? Of you don't course. you don't get to this sort of level if you're yeah, yeah. Uh, you know shabby by any stretch of the imagination. So it's all very um, very high level stuff. How does Australia sit by comparison to the rest of the world? Do you feel that we have an innovative uh, culture here? Um, how do we how do we sort of rank on the on the world stage in in this particular space? Australia is definitely among the best league. Really? No question about that. Okay. Uh, but there are a couple of slight um, perceptional differences that I have been noticing in Australian ecosystem. Australia has a very strong startup ecosystem and social entrepreneurship. Yeah. And even the uh, uh, platforms that are available for social entrepreneurs are quite at a very good level. Uh, but perceptionally, but I may be wrong, I'm still new in this particular role, but I feel is not most of the Australian entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs and who are venturing to these areas, they, in my personal opinion, they do not believe much about the world community. They believe a lot about the Australia itself. Okay. So, uh, meaning taking part in a global competition, I believe they do not consider that as a priority. 
Okay. That's kind of surprising to me, but maybe that is due to lack of awareness about such ventures like World Summit Awards. Yes. And uh, But that's an answer that I'm actively seeking. Uh, that's a question that I'm actually seeking an answer to as of now. So um, what you're saying is that part of your role, you're, you're going to try and expose what is this um, good ecosystem of startup culture. And we have got some really... Um, uh, high-level tech people in this country, right? Obviously, yes. And and you're going to try and take them or some of these ideas through and give them that uh, give them that exposure, or at least connect the two together, right? Exactly. To, to make exactly. them aware of it. Exactly. So, you grew up in Sri Lanka. Yep. You might have migrated to Australia at what age? Uh, just a year and a half ago. Just a year and a half ago. Yeah. Okay. So you've only been here eighteen months. Yep. Okay. I want to get to why you you came out, but tell me about growing up and particularly around the time you're a you're a developer yourself in this in this software space let's start with the first computer that you began working on <laughs> my first computer was gifted to me by my father that was a IBM Aptiva that was in i think 1997 yes yeah uh, the whole purpose of my father buying me a computer was to make sure that uh, i study better <laughs> that you studied better okay. i studied better yes. and using the uh, uh, material that are available, I mean, that is, th these are the early stages of computer. Like we're talking about of course, yeah. IT, you know, I think a lot of software companies that uh, the giants today were incubating. That's, that's right, right, yeah. Right? That's when they were all in their garages, exactly, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I was very interested about this computer and I was playing 24 7 with it. You know, Microsoft Word was one of the favorite tools that everyone was, you know, amazed about the first computer, right? Yeah. And then, um, I got my interest into mostly into the gaming side of it. Okay. Yes, obviously, I'm, I was a small kid and attract, getting attracted to games and things like that. Yeah. Uh, so my father bought. By the time I went into uh, my advanced levels, my father uh, gave me these um, CDs. Yes. On. Advanced levels of study you're talking about. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah. And um, uh, this physics, chemistry, biology. That was the stream I was into. So yes. he brought me this advanced CD. Where I know there are demonstrations and things like which was like, wow, very good. Yeah. I did study well on yes. that. At the same time, uh, whenever my father is not around, I was first started playing games. Then I wanted maybe I can do a little bit um, more than just playing games because mm -hmm. one problem all of us kids had was these games are available, but um, there's one famous game, let me call it, it's called Need for Speed. Need for, I remember Need for Speed, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was kind of a it game those yeah. days. So, and everyone was, you know, at school, we were talking about how many tracks did you unlock? How many cars have you unlocked? Because the more you play, the better you play, you keep on unlocking cars and tracks and all. Yeah. So I was like, um, well, if you have to organically do this, you will have to play 24-7 and you'll get kicked out of home yes. for playing games. <laughs> yep. There should be a better and easier way to do this. Okay. Right? So I was uh, trying to self-learn a little bit of coding, a little bit of uh, amateurish hacking, yes. so to say. So I was um, trying to decompile the executable files of the game and the DLL files of the game. And I was installing software like Microsoft Visual Studio, which was a development tool which was freely available due to... Um, the resources I was connected to. Yes. So using this, I was decompiling some of the uh, DLLs, libraries, and things like that. Then I was figuring out, okay, all, actually, all these things are available. They are not that. It, it never comes from internet or anything. It's just a matter of marking it as available, yes or no, kind of a thing, at the programming level. Okay. Right? Yeah. So I, I was able to go to the code level and enable certain things and make sure uh, there was this uh, 50th anniversary version of Porsche. Right. Uh, that was, I think, 2000, as I recall, 2000 or 2000, maybe 2001, I can't remember. I was able to unlock all the cars. Yes. All the tracks. Yep. And when I did that, I was like, wow, <laughs> on top of the moon. Then I was like, I but bet. when this game was starting, maybe I, this is like something uh, like illegal to do. <laughs> yes. But I was a kid, I didn't know much about. Yeah. Uh, it was done by a company called Electronic Arts. It starts with this beautiful EA logo. Okay. Yes. And I was like, now I cracked everything. I was like, Maybe I should give some credit to myself. Yes. I wanted my picture to appear there yep. when the game was starting. So I was like, where is this picture? The electronic cards, very first thing. So I was looking for it and there was not a single file. But then I figured out this very first image which was getting loaded is stored in 100 files. 10 horizontally, yes. 10 vertically. One image is split into 100. And there are 100 files collected together to create this file. Oh, okay. So this is all wallpaper. 
Okay, so I'm not a computer, you know yeah. a little bit about me, right? I'm not a, I'm not a computer yeah. uh, savvy, particularly at the coding level. So what you're talking about is in the in the in the depths of the program that makes it up. They were actually pulling different parts from the files to make this picture. Correct. Okay, I'll give a more easy to understand. Yes, do that. <laughs> Think about okay, if you take a picture now. Yes. And if you want to put it as your computer wallpaper. Yes. When you put it, you're putting only one image, one file. Right. Yeah. You put the file, it becomes the it occupies the entire width and the height of the screen. Got it, yeah. And so I was looking for this one file so I can replace it with yes. something of my own. Yep. There was no one file. Yep. There were hundred files. Okay. And how they have done was this particular wallpaper in the same example, imagine it being split into ten rows. Yes. So now we have ten. And again it is split into ten columns. Yeah. Now we have another ten. Yep. So ten into ten. Yep. We have hundred. Yes. So these hundred are saved in as hundred different files. Okay. Now I don't know why they did it, yep. but because they have done it that way, imagine having to uh, synchronize hundred files without having a proper editor. When it loads, to look like a seam, very so the, the, uh, as the program single image. So as the program's loading, it's piecing together these hundred bits and, 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 and displaying an image. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So and you fi you figured this out in the depths of the uh, code uh, itself. Code, code itself. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes. Got it. Yeah. So and uh, so I was really happy when I noticed that, and I was playing with it, and for a long time because it was difficult for me to align hundred elements of the same image. So yeah. I wanted my picture, and I put. <laughs> A very stupid comment saying all rights reserved and tracked by my name. Okay. <laughs> Which is something illegal, but yes. as a kid I didn't know. Yes. Uh, then I compiled it into a CD and yeah. um, I gave it to a couple of my friends and I became the hero at school. Oh, I bet you my, did, yeah. Everyone was like, you're the man. Yeah. I was like, well, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's so, uh, that, uh, one of the stupidest things I did as a kid. Well, but one yeah. of the things that led to, well, lit the fire for what has become a, um, you know, a, a, a very successful career now, right? Yes. So, yes. So I figured out what is right and what is wrong. But yes. The technical advancement and the knowledge I got, I now it led for the better path. So you did that at that age, you're pretty young. Correct. When did you figure out it was wrong? Ah, uh, just a couple of years after. The moment my father got to know, he said, "You can't get sued." Okay. Okay. I did something wrong. Yes. <laughs> Is and it? then, um, so was that a, you had a conversation with your father? I'm guessing at that time. Uh, that well, I didn't tell him. He got to know through one of his friend's son was complimenting about me at home. He, uh, he has told my father and he was like, what is this guy talking about? <laughs> and it. then you had to explain that? Yeah. Okay, so then where did you go from there? Uh, in, in, this, um, in this computer sort of coding space mm -hmm. because you obviously didn't stop. Yes, I mean, what, what, we, what we did as kids was, you know, just all experiment, just trial and error, trying some things out because, you know, the probing mind wants to, you know, try out experiment and different, different things. So then I wanted to systematically learn what computer programming is. Yes. Which made me self-learn a couple of computer languages like Visual Basic and C, C++, the basics of Java. Yes. I started with the very first language that I worked on is called DBase 3 Plus. That is like the DOS base. Oh, yeah. Application. That's like, you know, yeah. putting certain commands to get certain multiplications done. Yeah. So from that, we went to the UI stage and started learning more about the computer, better ethics and uh, how to use programming, then how to use it for your own benefit, not to modify something done by someone else, okay. but how to create something of your own that can bring value to others. And what was the first thing of real, what was the first thing you created that you were really proud of? I created, it's a security system that I created very first. Because, security system? Yes. It's, okay. it's kind of, you know, because we had problems like most of the, including myself, sometimes we were working on this, hard drives those days. Yes. The primitive stages of hard drives. And these do corrupt very easily. Okay. And sometimes your assignments to uh, your importance, uh, let's say scan documents to things like that go missing forever. Right. So is that before, uh, that would have been after you had the, like the big floppy? Uh, uh, this is the floppy era. Okay. Yeah. 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 I, mean, the, I remember I was having, uh, the very first computer was having a four gigabytes hard drive and that was like the best in the industry. Yeah, the four gigabytes. Wow. Then we increased it That's to, a photo these days. Oh, yes. Yeah. Even, yeah, of course, yes. Yeah. And then it became six, then it became 20, then you know the journey. Yes. So this is a security system, what I did. What it does is it creates a folder. 
Yes. In your computer after once you install it. Yeah. So this installation, I had legally put my name and the picture and all right, listen by myself, yes. proudly stamping it. Yeah. So when once you install it, there's so much of uh, branding going on at yes. the beginning of the installation. So it creates the folder called Unlocked. Okay. Right. Uh, the computer, the software gives you instructions when once you open to store all the important files in this folder then you're supposed to give a password and there are two buttons, unlock and lock. Yes. When you click on the lock button, this folder renames to lock. Yes. At the same time, it uh, encodes the file. Okay. And yeah. so even accidentally, you can't delete it. If you try to format the computer, the formatting command breaks uh, at the time of reading okay. that file. Yeah, because it puts yeah. a stop on the, exactly. on the, okay, on yeah. the process. Yeah, so you see, now if, if you are having a, my friend had a problem like this, you know, he has about two, three elder brothers. Sometimes yeah. when he downloads the game, Brothers come, uh, delete everything that he put. They put their own. Their own game on, yes. I need to protect my my <laughs> game, which is important to me. Yeah, kind of. So you know, it was becoming. It, it became a big hit. At so, school. and he used that program to do that on at home, right? Sorry, he used your program to do that exactly. at home for he himself. He used okay. one, okay. and many of many, many people used it. So, are you, what, what sort of age roughly are you about this time? I think I was um, fifteen, sixteen-ish. Okay, yeah. so you're not um, profiting off off these no, um, ventures all... at the moment. This is just a love, um, putting it yeah, out there and just, yeah. this is kind of like... The... Uh, earning a lot of uh, love back. As uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I bet, yeah. So after the security system, um, where, did you, where did you move on to? So after the security system, that was like, um, I kind of stopped experimenting and doing simple things on my own. Then I uh, focused and continued on my higher studies and got my degree through and then uh, we came to the stages of my early career. Yes. Then everything else I did was involved with the company and uh, that's the journey I came from that to this point. And uh, what, what degree did you get? What was your first degree? That was in uh, Management Information Systems, MIS. Okay. And then where did that lead you to in terms of a first job? Uh, my first job was a perfect fit to my degree because my degree was in MIS and I got the job as an MIS consultant to one of the banks in, in the country. Okay. And I was really pumped. I was like, wow, I'm entering a good company, a big company. I was like the, the very first job. And it was like I was, uh, the moment I entered the bank, I was like terrified. There are a lot of very senior looking people. It's a big crowd. I was like, you know, this small kid just fresh out of the graduate school. Yeah. So, but I had a wonderful supervisor. Uh, who's very passionate, driven, and he knew who I am from day one, and he kind of put the right foundation to me. Okay. And even to date, he's one of my best friends now. Oh, okay. Right. Right. He, so you stayed in touch, yeah? Yes, he's, he's now living in Qatar. Okay. He's, running, he's one of the uh, senior executives in one of the leading banks in Qatar. Okay. So, uh, so he paved the path for me to uh, develop my career very well, that I really respect him, and I, my gratitude goes back to him even now. Yes. Right. So uh, the division that I was attached to was called MIS division, that is the Management Information Systems division. Right. We did the most boring tasks at the <laughs> bank because we were doing the reporting okay. for the bank. Yeah. But Matt, these reports were of paramount importance to the senior um, uh, management of the bank. Because oh, of course, yeah. They made decisions on behalf of the bank and the bank stakeholders by looking at these reports. Yeah. It's about profitability of a branch to... Uh, and customer level to many, and many products are working I'm guessing all of that sort of stuff yeah and about experimentations on new products how to refine them uh, MIS division had a um, lot of uh, it was a big headcount division yeah and the more I spent time in this division I felt there's a lot of inefficiencies okay meaning uh, people were this is where the banks people use a lot of Excel and these people don't use the mouse Yes. Uh, even I was really impressed by my boss. He was like, he, was, he told me, if you want to be an expert in Excel, throw away your mouse. Really? Use the keyboard, keyboard shortcut. Go oh, ahead. Okay. Yeah. Right. I was like, wow, he's yeah. the man I need to follow. Okay. So, uh, and you know. He, and then, because the mouse is too slow, am I getting this? No, what he told me was when he started using the mouse and going here and there, it is number one slow, number yes. two, it makes you look amateur. Doesn't okay. make you look, but if you, use keyboard shortcuts, you're faster, your hand-eye coordination becomes better and you feel you're more professional. And okay. you spread that image to others and others look at it, wow, look at it. It's fast, oh, okay. it gets things done faster. So was that in the time that the um, the mouse must have just come into sort of mainstream? We were talking about the rollerball mouse. We had, remember, you had to, when you flip it over, turn it yes. around, there's this heavy ball, 
So the first iteration not the of the mouse. Okay, so yeah. the first iteration of the mouse, which are a little bit inaccurate and were slow, right? No, no, the okay, best. now now, no, now I'm with you in terms of uh, yes. the, the, the kind yeah. of like yes. the, the, it the works, time. But it right. is slow. Yes. So my supervisor, we wanted to uh, he, he wanted to come up with a new software system to okay. uh, increase the efficiency of this MIS division, and I was uh, one of the key members of the software development team, yeah. uh, and we had a very good team as well. So collectively, we were developing a new system for the. Uh, uh, MIS division. Once this was done, bank was extremely happy, but it created a lot of other problems. It made a lot of people's jobs redundant. Okay. And so, you know, uh, previously it was like everyone was working, you know, all heads down from 8 a.m. till 5 p.m. from first day of the month to the last day. Now yeah. it became first couple of days you are extremely busy, then after you don't have much work because this system gets everything done. So you automated a lot of these uh, automated quite uh, a lot of things. data uh, collation and uh, ordering and all that sort exactly, of stuff? Exactly. Okay. In, in my exact example, now, I get extremely busy uh, the first five to six days because we do the data collection and cleansing uh -huh. and feeding in. Yeah. Then system takes care of everything. It runs for a couple of days, actually, a large number of data. And we're uh, talking about the data from the previous month. Previous month. Crunching right. data, that data and for com moving comparison forward. for the month before yeah. and the last year, same month, and many, many views. Oh, comparisons right. and all that. Right. Right. Yeah, got so, it. After about sixth, seventh day of the month, it's like, you know, I don't have anything to do. Yeah. <laughs> but the bank is extremely happy. Man, yes. like, wow, you've done your job. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of the month. I was like, no, this is not good. Yes. I'm too young in this career. Just, I'm just a couple of years into it and yeah. I'm getting comfortable doing nothing. Yeah. So I told myself, I need to shift gears. It was a tough decision at that time because everyone liked me and I liked the place, but I wanted to move out of the bank and uh, move into the software development industry itself. That's quite interesting. So that says a lot about... Uh your character probably now but certainly back then so you you didn't want to get stuck there in in that box right you you had you had that inside you to to do more and be more right exactly i got scared actually that you were slowing down yeah i, I was like okay first five to six seven days i know it's a lot of sense of achievement you get something done everyone is happy about it then after the rest of the 20 to 25 days of celebration doing nothing it's like no it's not good that's not good yeah okay. it's not good <laughs> yeah so you move, you 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 made the decision to move on from the bank then exactly and um, looking at the the local culture of it as well it was very uh, uh, difficult for many people to understand why are you leaving a bank yes because banks are considered the best place to start the career and end even career. to end the career yeah yeah right yeah. you don't leave a bank yes there's a lot of uh, other benefits are surrounding you in a bank, but I wanted to take that decision and my parents were with me and um, took that uh, call at that time, which I really am happy about. Yes. So I joined uh, uh, one of the leading software development companies. Okay. And I joined at the capacity of an HCI engineer. Okay. What, is it, what does that stand that for? Human Computer Interaction Engineer. Okay. What does that mean? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is the mix of engineering and psychology okay it's about yeah. think about matt you as the human being me as the task that you want to perform yes and technology comes in between us telling yeah. that you can get this task done better by using this okay but the perception is you don't see the task that you are going to get and you see technology right right and you get scared because there's something new to you yes right and Which is why some people are a bit um, slow to adapt new exactly. technologies. Exactly. Some people okay. are a little resistant. Some people are a little um, not ready to welcome technology. Right? Okay, so this is interesting because they get caught up in the middle and not looking at the end task. Exactly. Okay. So the study, like of, yeah. the study of HCI in, in simple terms is about usability engineering. Okay. The main target is to make sure the technology layer sits not in between the human and the task he wants to perform, but it becomes an enabler, foundation. Okay. Right. Where you don't see the technology, you are enabled by the technology to get your task done faster, more efficiently, and it saves you time, makes your life easier. So it's a different way of looking at the same situation. Exactly. And sort of reformulating that exactly. relationship. Exactly. It's, it's a, as I previously said, it's a, it's a mix of engineering and psychology, understanding how human brain works. Yes. And what it wants done, and what it does not want to see in between. Yeah. So I joined at this capacity of an HCI engineer to this company and we were looking at, uh, the company had a wonderful portfolio of products spanning across multiple sections, sectors. Uh, so I was a part of uh, re-architecturing this software, yes. uh, re-architecting, 
and, and is this, refining is this, it. Is this software, uh, we're out of the banking industry now, so what sort of um, industries um, are we different, in? Different industries, mostly in the telco sector, okay. telecommunications right. and human um, resources, HR, yep. and a couple of ERP level systems. So I'll give you another example. Now, taking an example back from banking itself, think about a computer system that a banking executive needs to look at from the moment he walks into the office until the moment he walks out of the office. Okay. The colors we use, yes. the size of the icons, buttons we use, the text, the typography we use, and how we lay functionalities, how many clicks does he or she has to go through to get certain functionality done, and how frequently certain functionalities are performed. Yes. If you don't think of all this, there's unwanted intensity built in the back of the mind. Yes. And that impacts the human being at office, at home. Okay, got so it. So HCI is to make sure that... Oh, yeah, it rolls out in the rest of your life. Yeah, exactly. okay, I understand what you're saying, yeah. Uh, HCI's intention, human interaction, human computer interaction, is to uh, bring usability and focus, meaning making it a very pleasant experience. You know, you should be like, wow, this is my system. And everything I do quickly is at a fingertip. Yeah. And everything I do once a month, yes, it can go through a couple of clicks. Yes. Right? Simple examples like, and what kind of colors I look throughout the day? Am I getting uh, exposed to high intensity hues, which is having a negative impact on my retina? And yes. that has certain unwanted neural sparking and my chemical balance changes. So if you're, changes. if you're designing a, 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 an interface or a screen that you have to look at all day, what's the what colors do you lean towards and which colors do you stay away from? Ideally, you had to stay away from the high intensity colors. For example? Red. Red, okay. Reduce red. Yep. That doesn't mean don't use red in software at all. But I mean, that, you can't simplify it in one line like that, Matt, based on okay. which industry you're in, what you're used to, what you want to see, and your perceptional influence has a lot to play with that. And is that industry um, specific is what you say? Mostly saying? it's industry specific and okay. it's age group specific. It's gender specific. But, you know, think about a software system that is built for uh, education sector. Yes. Uh, even teachers who are involving with young kids, they don't want to see very professional colors and very streamlined icons. They want to see something nice and bubbly and very much connecting and close to children. Yes. So, it, so it's age, sector, gender, a lot of things come into play. Okay. So you consider all these things when you're, when you're um, uh, re-engineering and cleaning up some of these different systems that you're looking at? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And that's the exercise I was first attached to. Uh, I was doing when I was first attached to this software company. Okay. And I did this for about three years at the capacity of an engineer, so I was slowly moving up in seniority. Yes. And then again, the same thing happened. I, I got bored. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that is because, you know, we, the product portfolio, we, like, got almost everything done. Okay. Then uh, everyone is happy, but except for me. Yeah. So, so I spoke to my senior management. I said, I need a bigger challenge. Yes. I have this um, passion to do something with a team. Give me a team. Okay. And uh, But I was very fortunate that the senior management was very good and they were listening to me always and they were very encouraging. And uh, they believed in me, which I'm really grateful to. Uh, so they gave me five engineers, yes. made me a project manager, and threw a project at me, which is of higher magnitude than that I, that I thought of. And I was scared, extreme. Yeah. I was like, I wanted a challenge, but... Oh my God, this is huge. Yes. So, but you know, I knew that definitely we can do it because not me as an individual, but because I have a team now. Yes. And the team was really good and they believed in what I believe and we, we all connected together. We had the right passion and we achieved all the KPIs in that project. Okay. And that was a big hit. Yes. So that's how I started the career as a project manager in the company. Okay. And what sort of, um, I'm not sure if you can name the project or not. Can you give us an overview of what, you, what the um, project was about? The very first one was an e-commerce project. Okay. I prefer not to use the name because of the confidentialities that we um, Understand. Uh, yep. company signed with. Yes. Right? <laughs> so it was a big e-commerce project. You can think of it like one of the common e-commerce pro uh, platforms that are available to everyone. Yes. Kind of a local uh, system that was rolled out in, um, in, in the country at that time. Okay. But that was like the biggest Yep. Right. So and so I slowly moved, I moved into project management. Then I started getting more projects, and my team grew. Yep. Moved into uh, operations management, and then uh, with, uh, this is a group of companies I was attached to. Yep. And I was um, uh, I, I wanted to come up with a different arm to the company, so uh, I was able to create a new branch, which became 
subsidiary which became a company within the group. Okay. And I was heading it for the last five years of my career in that company. So that's head the, of the company. The entrepreneur model, is that exactly, right? Exactly, exactly. Okay. And that is specifically into software development outsourcing. Okay. So it was a software development outsourcing center that we ran. Yes. So you, so you weren't doing it, you were you were finding people uh, offshore to do it or no, were they no, outsourcing no, 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 no. to you? Uh, had we had a team of engineers. Yes. We get projects from different countries, we develop it on behalf of them. Okay, so, so, you're, the yes. so you're the actual developers. Exactly. We okay. Were so in that five years, what did you develop? Many things. More than 50 large, highly scalable projects. Okay. And when you say customer. large, highly scalable, what are we talking in terms of um, size? Uh, we are talking about uh, easily, I can quote examples from one of the projects, it's about 8.5 million transactions a day kind of project. 8.5 million transactions a day? Yes. That's, okay. that's one of the largest projects I was part of. Okay. Right? And that is just one. And, so uh, you built, so just for, because this is quite uh, amazing for me, yeah, not yeah. understanding anything about this, um, you built the you built the system, you built the code, you built everything from ground up to, to facilitate, handle, manage, correct. problem solve, anything, everything to do with that, uh, those transactions in correct, a day. Correct, correct. Not me wow. as an individual, the team. You, your yeah, team, yeah, I understand, yeah. yeah. I was directing the team. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And there was just one project and we did plenty of those and... As a company, we were we are bound to bound in very strict non-disclosure agreements. So I'm not in a position to expose names. Yes, but I most of these uh, companies that I work for is well known by anyone. Even if I tell this name, you will know. Ah, you know the company. So global companies, global and, companies and, and around global the world. Brands, yeah. Plus, I was very fortunate to get to got to travel around the world and we got a better, bigger uh, exposure. I met very interesting people and I was continuously getting inspired by people. And it um, it was fundamental in my growth. Okay. Yeah. So, um, can you get the the work that you did during that time? Um, so all of that's bound by confidentiality. Is that right? Everything in in Most that, of in the that five years. Okay. Yes. So, because like we are like the people behind the curtain. We get the work done. Yes. On behalf of someone else. Yes. And that's a lucrative business to be in. So you don't need to be in front of the curtain. Yeah. No. I understand. Yeah. I understand. Um, so after that uh, that five year period, where did you head? Um, let me tell a little bit more about the latter part of that five-year period. Oh, please, yes. Right? I'm so, jumping ahead. <laughs> yeah, so, so, that, um, so we were doing the so-called enterprise-level solutions. Yes. And these are not the fun stuff. These are the boring stuff, number crunching at high levels of large TPS and things like that. But uh, I always wanted to, the, the probing mind I have, you know, I've always wanted to do something different and new and fun and funky. Yes. And something to leave a mark. Yeah. Right? So... Uh, I had this passion to move into mobile application development okay. because everything what we did was on a client server architecture level. We went into cloud architectures and things like that. Mobile was picking up. This was the time, you know, uh, iPhones were picking up. Yeah. Very first iPad is getting rolled out. People don't know what it is about, you know. Yeah. But I knew there's a huge opportunity. The app stores are picking up. You know, this like, it was. It didn't have a proper direction, but everyone is trying their own thing. And I was like, trying to figure the direction. Uh, out. I had yeah. the best guys with me. Yeah. Why don't Why don't we jump into it? I spoke with my senior team. They were like, "Yes, let's do it, Sachi." So, as the first attempt, what I did was, I spoke to some of my existing customers, and I told them we can do a couple of mobile apps as as a complementary layer to your current systems. And most of the people didn't get this uh, because maybe it's a little too new. Then again, I thought maybe my approach is wrong. And so I okay. want to come up with a better strategy because the question is, we haven't done this. We haven't done any apps. So I came back and went back to the drawing board and got my seniors together and we were just uh, brainstorming. And then again, I thought, okay, let's come up with a strategy. Two steps. Mm -hmm. One, let's do a series of apps of our own, okay. which yeah. is yeah. fun, simple, but let's make it elegant, classy, beautifully designed. So to bring the wow effect. So it was almost like you were um, building your own like lookbook, right, for to take out to the market that Correct. this is what's possible. Exactly, exactly. Yep. So we had this idea pool every Friday from three to five. My scene is with me. You know, we are just throwing ideas at you know different any creative idea. Yep. It can be you know uh, a idea to do a game to a timer to a anything that sounds very silly. But what he wanted was to come up with a couple of ideas where we can convert into apps develop them, put it to app stores, Google, Apple, yeah. and to see how people respond to this. Okay. So we did like quiz apps, 
little, little games, yeah. timers, yes. and things like that. And we rolled it out to Apple App Store and Google Play Store. And we were observing customers come in, we were refining, we were doing a couple of things. Then it started going really well. And we started getting a large number of downloads because I said, we are not doing this to make money, let's put it for free. Okay, yeah. This is a learning exercise. This is stage one of my strategy. Yes. So once we got this done, we had a large number of downloads and we have an active follower base. The second stage of the strategy is to take this to our existing customers and tell, look at this. Yeah. We have done this. Now, what we have done is fun and nice and elegant. Let's bring uh, the enterprise to mobile. Yes. I started speaking about enterprise mobility. Yep. Right? I spoke, about, spoke to a couple of uh, large customers in Europe and said, uh, these are decision makers. Now, uh, we had a couple of DSS decision support systems okay. for senior executives. Why you know they are running on you know to have a couple of information to make decisions on the fly without going through the entire reports. Yep. Did apps on top of the current existing large scale systems? Okay, so pulling data, pulling the relevant data out yes. to make decisions quickly. Exactly. Okay, yeah. And it worked. Yes. So this strategy was on the on on, on the dot. Yeah. It was, it was really good. So we started developing apps for many customers and everyone started seeing it because they saw our competency in doing it and they liked our strategy of bringing the fun and beautiful apps into boring uh, decision-making tasks yes. and making it kind of gamified. This was about the word gamification was not even invented at yep. that time. People didn't talk about it. Yes. Right? So I used the term enterprise mobility at that time. Yes, this. I like it. Yeah. And uh, then while doing this... Um, I was fortunate to have managed more than 70 mobile app specific projects, okay. more than 70, but I, I have a list of 70 projects that I really don't remember, yes. uh, don't want to forget about, Yes, okay. the most remarkable ones. And so I built a special expertise in this area due to this exposure. And So would you, just to jump in there, at this time, uh, you're really teaching yourself, I guess, about how to do this because it's right back at the start of when these app stores just sort of the concept was just being developed. Apps, yes. So you, you, you're, this is all like on the grounds, in the trenches, trying to figure it out because no one's done this before. Correct. Like Every, ever. Everyone is doing at the same time. Right, okay, yeah. yeah. So, so we are not the first to do, but we are amongst many to do. Yes. But no one has done it and refined and told the world this is the way to do it. Yeah, so there's no roadmap. You've got there's to figure no that out. Yeah, we okay. have to figure yep. it out. And we are a small bunch of team which we are driven by passion. Yes. And so that's what we shared and we... I did a couple of uh, interesting projects and then came to the level where, you know, I wanted to um, do a couple of projects on my own. Okay. Um, did two. Yep. One project in the scope of uh, personal finance. Yes. The other one is in the area of music. So I co-founded two apps mm -hmm. uh, within this company. First one, the personal finance one, that is out of a painful personal incident series of incidents because okay. I, I, I got to travel a lot, Matt, yes. these days. And one problem I have is whenever I come from Europe or it can be from uh, a different country, I have a pile of bills, yes. receipts with me. Yep. And it's tedious to go to my finance division and uh, talk to them and reconcile everything. You know, I'm, you know, as finance people, they take time. Yes. And I, it was a pain. It was, I'm wasting time. Yep. So I felt like, what if I have an app with me every time when I go on a business visit, I track everything then and there. I, I have the ability to create report, shoot it back to my finance division before even I get on the flight. When I land, everything's ready. Money's ready for me to be collected. Yes. So that's the personal intention I had. Okay. But then if I ask myself, if I have to make an app out of it, I need to make broader sense because it's about addressing masses. So how can I uh, do a greater good by bringing this concept as a foundation, but in which flavor am I to put it out to the wild? Right. So then uh, one thing I felt was the common problem what we all have is we are really good at spending, but we are not good at, not that good at saving. Yes. So then, uh, okay, I think I knew, okay, that's it. Let's encourage people to save more. Okay. And so we came up with the name, uh, we called the application Expense Tracker 2.0. Okay which I know you can still get in the App Store. Yes. If you want to go down and download it now, you can. Yeah, you can do it. Yeah. And we call it the best way to spend while you save. Perfect, and, yeah. And why I call it 2.0 is because there were many expense tracking applications. We wanted to show this is something better. Okay. And this was, we rolled it out to the market in 2012, December. Yes. This okay. was a few years back. Yeah. Many years back, actually. Yeah. Right. And uh, this became a hit. And another strategy that worked really well is at this time, in the very first version of the app, we did it tailoring to the Apple iPad. Okay. 
Okay. Because this was the time, man. Oh, they were new, right? That time. Uh, iPads were new. Yeah. But what happened was there were plenty of iPhone applications, but iPad was running. Most of the iPads were running iPhone applications. With this, if you can remember, the 2X. Yeah. You open yeah, the yeah, iPhone app and, yes, it, yeah. and it scales up, but it has black corners border because it's an iPhone perfectly. app yes. running on a larger screen. It's just larger, right? It's not actually another app. They're just yeah, double the size. Yeah, just zooming. It's getting pixelated. Yeah. It doesn't look nice. It is not getting the benefit of the app. So we, dis- that. we designed it to pixel map the iPad screen. Okay. Proper horizontal layout. Yeah. Using all the pixels, using all the high definition screen, the color accuracy, everything to the to its benefit. Yes. So this became a big hit. And when you say a big hit in app terms, is that um, by how much? Uh, was it a free app? I'm not, I'm not uh, sure. At the beginning, we wrote it out as free. Okay. Uh, to experiment a little bit, then after we made um, its application was free to download. Yeah. But it had premium features and it had had a oh, so it's cap like the, of usage. It's like up to five transactions. Oh, so that's when you have free. like the in-store... In-app purchases. In-app like purchases. That's what I, I, say, I yeah. famously used the quote uh, those days saying, I believe in giving the Ferrari yes. to be driven for one kilometer for free. Ah, there you go. Very good. After yeah. that, take it back. Okay. So you have given the flavor of it. Yeah. And that's so a you, classic marketing thing, right? Exactly. Try it before you buy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So... Um, you said it was a big hit. It's not a. Is it, is, do you measure that in uh, in, in downloads, in money made, in, in, in downloads? Like in and your money. in your language, how do you know? Like, okay, this is this is a hit. Yeah, because I, I mean, this is like early, early stages of app stores mm-hmm. and all. I mean, we are not a famous app development company. Yeah. So we started making uh, enough petty cash than what we were allocated yes. at the company level. Okay. It was like, wow, this is good. And oh, so you're uh, funding your own division. Exactly. The, okay, exactly, you got it. Yeah. Exactly. So it was like, wow, it was an eye-opener. And yep. people within the company were like, okay, that's an app under our name. And it was done by our guys. And yep. it was like, wow, that was a very good starting point. Yes. And then this app get into the, um, got into the uh, top ratings within a couple of countries. Mm-hmm. It didn't become a number one app, but it came to the uh, top 10 apps in a couple of countries like um, Canada, UK, Singapore. And it was within the top 20 in Indonesia, USA. And it was really, really good. So can you say, um, as it stands today, do you know, or can you say, do you know how many downloads you've got in total? Uh, Downloads-wise, we have close to half a million. Okay. We are about to pass half a million. Okay. But this app was, we are selling for $5. Oh, for $5 now, yeah, right. right. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, so it's still uh, generating income. It was generating good income. It okay. was quite nice. And if you, and if you continue to work on that app, like, I guess it needs updating along it, the way? It, uh, we did update a lot, and but yeah. now the app, um, for the past couple of years, we didn't do much of updates because right. um, it's self-sustaining and it's at a very usable level Okay. and uh, because then after I moved into my second uh, app which I co-founded it's Flip Beats. Yes, I want us to talk about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's uh, another personal passion I had, music. Yep. Well, uh, as a kid I was very much attached to music and uh-huh. I was doing a little bit of mixtapes and a little bit of DJing while I was studying and things like that. So one practical problem that I faced was now I was using uh, phones like Nokia those days then Moody to Blackberries then iPhones to Samsungs to everything you can name it those days but we saw how fast these computers these phones are picking up in processing power RAM and quality of the screen yeah. from the very first color screen to what we had in a couple of years yeah I remember the very first color screen phone I used which was a Sony Ericsson T65 I think okay. the name and that is a 256 pixel array, kind yep. of, you know, technically saying it, it's like, you know, bunch, looking at a bunch of pixels and yes. how things change over time very quickly. A couple of years down, you had high resolution screens and which is better than your laptop. Yeah. And one problem I felt was um, another side of the stories. You remember how we used to store music those days? It was on cassettes. Yeah. Right? And uh, then came the CD era. Yeah. And then... People didn't think about it much, but people started storing music in their phone. Yes. Right? So, at the end of the day, the most favorite collection of music is always in your pocket, in your phone. Yeah. Right? I, I had the same. Yeah. But I was using the default applications to listen to this music, which every iOS or Android device had, but yes. it's so pretty basic. It allows you to, yes, play, pause, seek, forward, rewind, and everything. But uh, if you're a bit of an audiophile, you need to refine your sound signatures. You need to 
get your EQs right, you need to go to a little bit of uh, advanced reverbs and things like that to mess around and get your exact sound signature. Yes. So I wanted to do an application which utilizes the power of the phones, advanced processors, right. allowing you to listen to your favorite musics in the best possible way that you can. So we're talking about actually sort of um, playing with the sound. Exactly. That comes refining the sound of the music. Refining is a much more exactly. elegant way of putting it. Exactly. Yes. Okay. It's so, you know reducing the noise signatures, and if you want, if you're a bit of a bass head, to increase your bass yes. and to balance your trebles and to you know push the vocals the right level. So very much like the same this. way as you change the levels on your car stereo, right? Exactly. Yes. During exactly, the yes. playing of your favorite exactly, song. Yeah. yeah. If, if you don't care about it, you'll have it flat, but if you do care about it, you'll you're always go through you know the eleven, no fifteen, no how many EQ points you have. Yeah. So. Uh, Flip Beats was put to the market with the intention of uh, allowing people to refine their music. Yeah. So, and we, uh, I mean, it is like you know bringing a mini recording studio into your pocket. Yes. And at that time, we called it the most advanced way to listen to music on a phone. Okay. And it, I believed it was. Yes. And this was lo- rolled, to ma- rolled out to the market in 2013 December, and it was picking up in uh, 2014 beginning. And uh, another interesting complimentary story to this was, this, uh, um, I recall it was in March 2014, mm-hmm. I was in Germany attending um, a conference, I think it was in Hanover, it's, it's a big event. I accidentally bumped into one of the senior executives of T-Mobile Germany and out of my passion I was showing off this app that I did you know, of course, yeah. with my team and I was just uh, uh, quite pumped about it yep. and he loved it. Yeah, okay. saying, uh, he said, oh, okay, that's quite cool and he was saying, this was 2014. This is when Samsung was rolling out the Galaxy S5. Okay. In, uh, in, in, in across the world. And he said, he's going to roll out in the same month. He was asking, can you give me this application for free so I can install in all the devices in Germany? Uh, complimentary. I said, go for it. And that's the starting point. That's, um, I've heard, I have heard this story before. I'm really yeah. glad you, you uh, yeah. told it while we were recording. But, um, that's phenomenal, right? To think that every so we're talking about in Germany or across it Europe. It was in Germany. I think I think we uh, had had it rolled out in Frankfurt and Munich first, okay. and it went across Germany. So every every Samsung phone that went under, out, under under T-Mobile, under T-Mobile, it that went out there. It, it, uh, it was preloaded. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm tipping that uh, your downloads really started to increase. Um, during those times, yes, that time, because right? would it register when you first turn the phone on? Does that register it uh, as a download? It, it, it's a default installed app. Okay. On the Android phone. Okay, so we're so talking about a, in the factory. Exactly. So you've so they're obviously doing many at a time. Yes, so your downloads yes. just went through the roof overnight. Exactly. Okay. Overnight. And and also uh, that got caught the attention of a couple of very interesting industry leading um, magazines like Engadget, Lifehacker. They started featuring it and talking about it. Yes. And timing was perfect. Then yeah. we moved into this was March. I was talking about. Then yeah. we came to the June, July time period. This yep. is when FIFA World Cup was uh, happening in uh, Brazil. Oh, wow, yeah. And so uh, uh, together with my uh, uh, colleagues and we came up with a good strategy. We said, listen to the rhythm of uh, football with flip beats. Okay, and and that was an advertising that was an a advertising slogan that you used. small campaign that we did. Mm-hmm. Boom, it became the number one app in Brazil. Oh, really? <laughs> like, what, wow. what, uh, what download numbers are we talking like um, through, uh, the, through the World Cup? Uh, so it was rated number one yes. in Brazil, and also it was among, rated among the top ten in Germany, okay. Russia, and yeah. India. Okay. And so Flipbeats uh, just passed one million downloads. A total uh, now. A total now. Okay. Yeah. And, awesome. Uh, that's Flipbeats only. So together with Expense Track and all these apps, you know, I mean, we didn't even think of having about at least ten thousand downloads. We just did it for the fun. Yes. Yes. And so now we are touching masses yeah. at a scale. That's and unbelievable. It's a beautiful story. So you're, um, like I'm tipping your other apps put together. I mean, that's at well, like that's at one and a half million. Those two, correct? Right? correct. Those two only. And you had seventy yeah. projects. You said that. Uh, yeah, uh, the other projects we've done for other companies. Yeah, of course. So, yeah, so yeah. I, I can't claim any ownership. No, no, I understand that. that. Oh, so you don't you don't credit that no, as no, your no, reach? No, okay, because no, no, you did it for no, someone no. else. Yeah, okay, that's this, fair. This, yeah, this this is the only two. Okay. Mostly to talk about, and it was flip beats which um, got into the radar of World Summit Award, we started the other chapter. So that's how all the dots got connected. Okay, so now we're back at the World yeah. Summit Awards, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you went there and you won yes. for Flipbeats? Yes, Flipbeats okay. won the media and entertainment category for okay. the year 2015. Awesome. And 
That's the story we spoke about. It yes. is. Now, the um, Flip Beats is in, an incredible success by any stretch of the imagination. It was. When you decide that you were getting bored, then it was time to move on again. Yeah, so I completed 10 years um, in this software development company. I loved it. I loved the people, my team. It was like family. I mean, I was not going to work. I was like, you know, waking up to join my team and you know, do something really great and, you know, have fun. It was, it was like the second home. Yes. I didn't know which one is home. Kind yeah. of. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was very comfortable. Yep. And then again, uh, the other side of me kicked in. I was like, time for you to make a move. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to um, leave this comfort zone to rediscover what I'm good at. Okay. And then I was thinking of uh, migrating to Australia. And then during one of these conversations, uh, this is where Logan comes into the picture. Yes. He's been on this podcast before. Just to Yes, yes. And I got to know that. Logan in 2012. Okay. Because he was one of uh, my customers before. I met him first time in Colombo in, in a uh, restaurant. We spoke about one of his businesses and I was the software solutions provider representing my company and he was the customer. So, we oh, so you, were you were developing for his company at that, or correct. who he was with correct. at that time. Okay. Correct. Yeah. correct. So uh, we, we connected from day one. You know, yes. Logan is a very passionate, driven person. And he certainly we, is. We both liked each other. Yes. And, and so that started a long-term relationship. So we did a couple of projects, very successful. He loved it. He was delighted. And so, but we were always in touch, you yeah. know, communicating this and that and updating each other of what we do, you know, became good pals. Yeah. And the moment he got to know I'm migrating, he started telling me about his new story, I for Creatives. Before we go there, yeah. why Australia? Uh, good question. I believe Australia has a better ecosystem in multiple perceptions. Okay, explain yeah. it for me. Looking at, um, okay, country position wise, Mm -hmm. uh, okay. uh, you're this, this might sound uh, geographical, silly. Geographical, you're talking This about. might sound silly, yeah. but the geographical positioning of the country is one of the most safest, I believe. Because oh, right, of the isolation factor? Yes, isolation yes. factor. And if you look at the weather conditions wise, even the winter doesn't go to extreme uh, minus levels. Mm -hmm. So that is very much livable. Yes. And obviously it's rated among the most livable cities, Sydney yeah. and Melbourne. Yes. So, and I had some, uh, had some family uh, here in Australia as well. So oh, you've got family here? Yes. Oh, in, I didn't know uh, that. Okay, not cool. exactly in Sydney, but in Perth. Okay, yeah. So, uh, But it's like two different countries, yeah, but well, still in yeah. the same continent, at least. Very much, yeah. So, and uh, I've dealt with many Australian companies, uh, which made me understand how uh, the IT sector works in Australia. So I had a very good understanding and familiarity with that. Right. So that was very much ticking most of the boxes to me. Yeah. And so that's that's like the main reason why. And I have many friends here. Okay. And who are Australians as well as people who migrated from um, other places. So, so those things were justifying enough for me to make the move when I wanted to make a move to a bigger plate. Right. So now we're at for Trades. Yes. Logan, when did he first give you the idea? So, uh, um, so, I was, uh, so we were talking about my migration and he, the mm -hmm. moment he got to know, he was saying uh, he's uh, working on this project called I for Trades and he was asking, uh, are you interested to join? And, uh, he was asking, inviting me to be his co-founder and the COO. I was like, what is this project? He was like, I for tradies. And then he was saying, tradies. That's the first time I heard the word tradies, <laughs> Matt. This because is quite funny. I was talking about this before. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, the word tradies is very much in the Australian vocabulary. It is, yeah. Not much known internationally. Use different different uh, alternatives for that. Yes. Very silly ones uh, yep. in, in, around the world. Yes, that's right. right? Yeah. Uh, so... I did a little bit of research about it and a couple of factors. One, I, we identified um, in Australia only, it's a $15.4 billion industry, mm -hmm. quite sizable. If you look at the trade and construction industry. Correct, yep. correct. If you look at the global picture, forget about the entire world, think about a couple of countries like US, Canada and UK, together yes. with Australia. Yeah. Those four countries only, it's about $500 billion plus uh, industry. So it's a massive playground. Yes. That, that ticked many boxes. Yeah. Uh, second, the Logan's product offering what he had to strategize is amazing. Yes. If you look at the sector, and he was explaining to me 
there are three main players. People like you and I, mm-hmm. trades consumer, who can be having a leaking tap at home or something wrong with our AC. Yep. We want this fixed. Yep. And there are trades business owners yes. who are running businesses with tradies as the employee. Correct. There are many software solutions targeted purely at the consumer side and purely at the business side, enabling them to uh, take care of their back-end operation. Yes. But there was none connecting these three elements together and creating a beautiful synergy among them. Yeah. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. And so I identified that's a blue ocean. Yes. That's not competition. Yeah. Right? So big playground, blue ocean, yes. and most importantly, this is coming from a person who I knew and who I trust. Yes. Okay. Um, there was no reason for me to say no to it. <laughs> so you had to say yes. I had to say yes, and here I am. So that was. W- w- when did you first like put your hands on that uh, uh, on that product in terms of starting to develop it? Uh, I think we were first discussing at the latter part of 2016. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the prototyping was done. In fact, Logan has invested significantly at a research level. Plus, he had very good exposure into the trade service sector for many years due to yeah. his um, previous engagements in the sector. And the MVPs were done, there was working prototypes, there were uh, there was a dedicated team working on it. So when I joined the team, uh, like the very initial steps were done. It was like a working prototype. And yeah. and the beautiful uh, arrangement of five credits is that, you know, okay, before telling that story, something commonly I've seen in the IT industry is most of the time, IT companies fail because as IT people, we try to develop something on behalf of someone else without getting into their shoes. Yes. But <laughs> iForidis doesn't have this mistake. Right? We have partners who are from the trades industry itself, yeah. who are our investors, and we co-create with them. They are part of us. Yeah. So we are not a bunch of IT guys trying to do something for a different industry. We have people coming in from the trades industry itself, IT experts, people like Logan who knows about the industry of IT, marketing to trades to everything. And plus, I believe I'm the, like the newest person coming into this industry, but what I can bring to the table is a different mix of expertise. So it brings a beautiful team together yeah. in for Trades, and that's, that's power. I think um, I've had a little bit of uh, experience developing in this place previously. Yes. And, um, I've told you a couple of times now, like I've yeah. sat in a lot of rooms where, where tradesmen try and talk to IT people and they kind of, you know, they do kind of butt heads a little bit yeah. about what's possible and what yeah. should be done and yeah. how it could be done and, yeah. you know, yeah. this and that and, and all that sort of thing. So yeah. that um, collaborative approach that you've taken mm-hmm. is um, is very different to anything else that I've seen in the industry as well. So exactly. that's a real... Um, uh, credit to, to Logan and, and you and the rest of the team that have actually been able to do that because yeah. um, it's critical to recognise that, right, to, to give yourself a chance of being in the game and collecting the best uh, parts of both sides of the equation, right? That's, that's fundamental. Yeah. Yes. So, I for Tradies, where, where, where are you at? Where are you? Um, you're, you've been involved for uh, six, uh, no, be longer than that, 12 more, months? Yeah, more, more than a year now. Okay. Right. So, uh, we have been working on this, Logan has been uh, investing in this for the three plus years and we developed a MVP, then we started putting more features during the last year and uh, something that we try to always balance is iFootRadies should not have all the features everyone is asking for. Okay. It should have the most fundamental features and we believe it has to be an enabler to tradies, trades business owners and consumers to get what they want done, maybe not in the way that they have been doing it, but in the best way that it should be done. So we need to be a, we have, we have to be a thought leader in the industry. Okay, so part of what you're doing is actually re-educating the trade trade industry, industry itself in the in a, in a slightly different way of doing it. So can you give me can you give a, a like a, a on the ground example of that about how uh, one aspect of using this app that would be maybe a little bit different to what is. Uh, previously thought as the, yeah. know, the the way it should be done? Yeah, because our, our focus is we try to always bring the customer as the center, foundation of the experience because no point having the most advanced software solutions to run your back end if you don't have customers for you. Yes. So we had to be customers. Yeah. Right? So iFootities is a customer-focused, 
or rather customer obsessed company. Yes. And we, we, we stand for the customer. So we believe in saving time for custom. We believe in making life easy for the customer. Because if you look at now, people talk about these disruptive technologies. Technologies don't become disruptive just because it's technically advanced. It becomes disruptive when people start accepting it and adopting to it. And it makes something practical exactly. actually better. Right? Exactly. Exactly. So that's what iPhotodis is all about. Okay. A good example is now this is like you can use iPhotodis app to uh, order a plumber. Yes. And you can see him coming on the map. Yep. So you don't need to worry about, okay, he said he'll come at 10. Will he come at 10? It's not a question. Yes. And when he comes in front of your house, app alerts you. So we have, you don't have to wait till he comes and rings your door. You can take care of your dogs and you, have to, you, you are ready to welcome him yes. in front. And little things like this, it makes a big difference at the end of the day. We've, um, we've talked quite a bit about this previously. Yeah. And um, I keep, a, like, I know it's a common thing to do, it's not always a great comparison to make, but this comparison with the, um, the taxi industry previously, right? Yeah. Where to get a taxi, you'd pick up the phone, you'd go on hold for 30, 40 minutes, yeah. and you'd book a cab, yeah. and it wouldn't turn up, then you'd have to <coughs> ring back, yeah. you wouldn't know what's happening. And then Uber comes along and says, hang on a second, we can just change a few little things here, yeah. put the customer, um, give them transparency, give them control, I guess you'd say, yeah. let them know what's going on, and boom, they take, I don't know how much of the market, but a huge uh, percentage of the market now, and probably yeah. drawn, I guess, more users in as well, just because they've made something, or a fundamentally old industry of just driving people around in cars, um, so much more easier, right? Exactly, exactly. And, that's, and that is, and I don't want to speak for you, but um, that's what you're attempting to do here, right, with, the, with, with Eye for Trade is taking that, that new view on an old industry and crack a new way of going about it. Absolutely right. And now we are also in the stage of bringing the fourth element to this um, uh, a current triangle that we have. We spoke about the trade. So we're turning, we're, we're, you're, 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 where? <laughs> you're, you're turning a, uh, a triangle into a square. What exactly, are, how are we doing exactly. it? Exactly. So we spoke about the trades consumer. We both spoke about the trades business owner and the tradee. Now we want to bring the facilities manager as the fourth element. Because if you look at Australia itself, there are so many facilities managers, Matt. Yes. Uh, they are responsible of managing um, residential properties, commercial properties, or even shopping complexes. Yes. They have a lot of pain points, yep. and iPhotodis can easily complement them. I, uh, this, the fourth element that we bring in, it can even be a white label solution where it can run under their brand name, allowing them to do what they do better than how they do today. At the same time, getting the benefit from the complementing product portfolio iPhotodis has. And again, that um, comes back to transparency, right? Because being a trades, uh, business owner, operator, and all that sort of stuff, there's not a hell of a lot of problems that can't be solved with just a little bit of extra communication along, exactly. along the way. Exactly. Most people generally try and do the right thing. You know, yeah. you have your people who don't from time to time, mm -hmm. but that's life, right? So most people generally do the right thing. Yeah. If we're just open and honest about what we're doing, yeah. the problems are solved. go down or are solved, yeah. Exactly. So that's, uh, so your your, your full-time every day, that's your, that's your big, Big that, project at the moment. That's the big baby. I wanted to just have a couple more questions before we wrap yeah. up, um, mm -hmm. Sachi. But uh, I wanted to ask you, from all the knowledge that you that you have in the technology space, from what you've done, what do you see big in the next three to five years? Because we keep, I, I keep hearing uh, in the media and kind of this feeling that we're at a bit of a, a, a tipping point, maybe in terms of like a few different technologies that are, you know, you've got AI, virtual reality, and there's like you know a gamut of these things that we're sort of just um, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, and is it all about to happen? Like, where, what do you see as big in the next three to five years? Um, I think you are correct in uh, identifying this technology that you mentioned as big. You know, AI is huge. It's gonna we don't know what it's going to do. Yeah. We know it's huge, right? And things like machine learning, things like AR, VR, and even uh, blockchain is becoming a fundamental mm. uh, change to every industry, not only in car cryptocurrency itself. And But there's another element that I believe in, Matt. Uh, this is maybe because this, I got this exposure because my of the involvement with the World Summit Awards. Yes. It's about... I believe it's high time for all of us to think about the sustainable development. 
Of course, yeah. Right? Okay. Because uh, if you look at us as entrepreneurs or intrapreneurs, we may be driven by multiple factors. Yes. This can be our passion for technology. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm a hardcore crypto guy. Or it yeah. can be because I'm a hardcore AI guy. Yeah. Right? Or it can be a different vision that we have on a certain particular path. Yes. Or it can be even just monetary benefits people are expecting by being an entrepreneur. Yeah. But I believe regardless of what our drivers are, it's high time for us to think about the sustainable development goals set by the United Nations. There's yes. 17 of them. This is a good way to self-reflect yourself, look at our own businesses. Yes. You don't have to change much. Yeah. Just have to look at it from this framework and rethink about what you do and figure out how you can refine what you do, maybe a little bit, so it can contribute better to your local community, right? Contributing to a greater cause. And I believe if most of us start thinking like that, uh, it's going to create the snowball effect on the global community. Can you, of the 17, have you got uh, maybe a couple of examples you can you can give us? Uh, SDGs are very simple concepts, Matt. It's like, um, think about giving focus on quality education. Yes. Clean energy. Yeah. Meaningful consumption of resources. Not wasting stuff. Not wasting stuff, yeah. right? And even uh, trying to eradicate poverty, right? You don't need to be uh, just... Um, running charity organizations, you can be doing your businesses, but try to align what we do in a way such that it is more aligned, more focused in contributing to at least one of the SDGs. Yes. And that will give you a more meaningful reasoning as to why we are entrepreneurs. Absolutely. And, and a more justifiable reason to why we do what we do. And there's just... Um well, from what I've looked at, some of these things can really be achieved um, with not groundbreaking changes in direction, right? Like some of them are just 1% or 2% here or there that can actually, you know, you extrapolate that out over the next 5 or 10 years building your company and then in turn the impact that it has. And all of a sudden that one little thing that you do has a huge impact, right? Exactly. And exactly. it takes no, a lot of time and no extra effort or makes the process even better if you do it anyway. So it's... A, it's about bringing aware, excuse me, awareness to that. Is that what you're exactly. saying? Exactly. It's, it's, it's an increased awareness. Okay. So I believe regardless of what technological trends that we talk about, yes, AI is huge, crypto and VR, AR, we talk about machine learning. You can be driven by many factors, but try to bring SDGs as a framework to really look at what we do. Okay. So that will allow us to continue to do this because if you look at what sustainable development is, that is development... Uh, meeting the needs of the present without compromising the future generations to meet their own needs. Yes. Meaning, we should con be able to continue our development without destroying our world, yeah. complementing it, making it a better place. So next generations to come can continue to do this at a bigger scale. And if um, anyone wants to get information about that, you just wrote a good article um, reflecting from some of the parts of your trip which is available on, on your website, LinkedIn. which I'll make links to, and um, and also through LinkedIn? Correct, correct. LinkedIn. I published on LinkedIn. Yeah. And also LinkedIn. on the United Nations website itself. Just Google it. It's there. Google Free, it. Freely available. It's there. Yes. Nice. Okay, a couple of questions, Sachin. We're going we're to wrap this up. Um, a question uh, that I ask everybody, if you'd have one law changed or implemented, what would it be? <laughs> Good one. I think... Regardless of uh, where people are from, yes. pe people should have um, better freedom to travel around. Okay. Right. I Meaning access to countries. Um, I, have, I have a good example. Once I was visiting a summit somewhere in, um, uh, in a country in Europe and yeah. I had to, I, I missed that mainly because the visa that was stamped on my passport, yes. the date was, the starting date was 11th, but it was typed as 17th. For some reason, the typing was so close, even I didn't notice it. Ah, right. So I was turned around and sent back at the Frankfurt Airport. So you go into a, a UN... Not a UN, oh, this, so this is a business just, conference. Just a bit, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I was like, okay, I mean, I missed that. But think of, um, I mean, this, this is a simple thing, but think of someone who's really from a more deserving country trying to get a one-of-a-lifetime opportunity. Yes. That happening to him or her. 
that is catastrophic. Yeah, I, absolutely. Yeah, it's catastrophic. Yeah. So I believe if people can have better access to enter countries, yes, security is important. Yes, we need to have other restrictions, but I believe we need to use technology in a way to get rid of these doubts and problems without making it a barrier to yes. deserving people to travel around and make impactful change in their lives, their communities, and at the global scale. That would be the one thing I would like to. It'd be, uh, yeah. it'd be great to see, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, are you a book? Are you a reader? Do you read books at all? Being from a what, electronic books, I'm, uh, e-books, I'm assuming, or not exactly a big book reader. Okay. You know, in fact, I get scolded for this from my parents. Yes. Uh, my father is a massive reader, but I read a lot of articles. I read a lot of websites. Yes. I have a morning routine. I read a couple of articles as well as I listen to a couple of uh, subscribed channels. On YouTube itself, oh, yes. so I'm a different version of a reader. Okay. So, to say. so what are the channels? What are the websites? Because I normally ask for um, yeah. uh, book recommendations. Yeah, most, um, yeah. What are the websites you go to first thing in the morning? Yeah, I mostly go through uh, these again technology buyers like um, yes. uh, Verge, TechCrunch, and yes. Lifehacker, and those are just few. Plus, I have a couple of subscribed YouTube channels. Some are famous, some are not. Yes. So that's like that's my morning dose of encouragement. So just day. to keep your fingers on the pulse. And exactly. Exactly. In the game, yeah. Where, if someone wants to get in touch with you, are you comfortable with them uh, approaching you? Where do they find you? Just Google my name. Just Google your <laughs> name. It's uh, yeah. and it will come right up, right? You've yeah, got, yeah. There's, there's a lot out there. Yeah. 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 I, I was doing a little bit of uh, research for this, and yeah. everywhere I look, uh, yeah. you're one of those people that um, you. I've gotten to know you a little bit, yeah. and every time that uh, you, you look or you know you, you turn the corner, there's you've you've done something else, and there's something else. You know you find out something new, and there's a, there's a ton out there on you. So, um, yeah. Sachi, thank you for uh, sitting down. Um, it's been a been a, been great to chat. Um, a blast to find out a little bit more about about what you're doing, and um, you're uh, you're a high achiever, mate. And I I really uh, really look forward to seeing your journey over the next. A uh, few years because um, if the past is anything to go by, the the next few years is going to be pretty exciting too. So thank you. Thank you, Matt, for having me. Hey, everybody, it's Matt again. Thanks for listening. Just a couple of things before you guys clock off. You can get all Trench Talk episodes at xrm.com.au forward slash podcast. You can also sign up for other goodies at the same site. Just plonk your email in there and you are covered. That's x for x-ray, r for Romeo, m for mike.com.au forward slash podcast if you really like what i'm bringing you please head to itunes subscribe to this show and leave a review right there and lastly if you want to contact me directly type the at symbol followed by mr matt reynolds into your search bar and you'll find all the social links goodbye